All right, let's begin our time together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we come to you aware that you are always merciful, you are always loving, and you are always accepting of us, Lord. Help us to find rest, as, rest in this, and help this time to be one where we might come and draw closer to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, welcome to Seculosity, which is our new uh, Lions Forum series. Uh, it's based off a book by David Zoll, um, and if you don't have the book, that's fine, but I do recommend the book. It's, it's quite good. Um, but the series will kind of follow what he uh, writes about. So to begin our time today, you will notice that I have given you uh, sheets with blank answers in them. <laughs> um, so I thought we could just maybe ponder some of these questions. Uh, one, how would you define the word religious? How would you define the word secular? Two, have you ever felt like you were at church even though you weren't? So maybe write down where that place might be. And three, I will have lived a good life, good enough life, if blank. So I'll give you a few minutes to, to ponder those answers. Would anyone like to share a definition for the word religious? Focus on Christ. Focus on Christ. There you go. Okay. Anyone else? How about the word secular? What does the word secular mean? Yeah, so the public life, public sphere, without formal faith. So that's kind of the, the basic answers to both those questions. Um, so we begin with this kind of admission that we as Americans have been getting less and less religious. Based off your answer, and I think that's a pretty good one. Um, there are less and less of us who uh, claim a faith in Christ, or claim any sort of faith, really. Um, there are all sorts of graphs to prove this. This is one I just pulled off the internet. Um, it shows church membership uh, starting from the uh, 1930s, actually, to today. And you can see that in 1948, we peaked at a time where 76% of Americans said they belonged to a church or some other religious community. Today, that number is less than 50% of Americans who claim that they are religious or belong to a church or a religious community. Uh, the Episcopal Church has <laughs> an even more, more startling decline. <laughs> in 1966, we had 3.5 million members. Today, they just published, actually, the uh, 2019 parochial report, and <laughs> it revealed that there are just 1.6 million Episcopalians. So that's, that's a loss of over a half of our members over the last 50 years. And the, the story gets even worse when you consider the actual people in the pews on a Sunday um, there, uh, this past year, there were, on average, on an average Sunday, about 516,000 uh, people in an Episcopal pew. And this is especially startling when you consider that, according to an economist article, there are one million Americans who believe that they have had a personal encounter with aliens. Which makes you wonder what the aliens are getting right that we're getting wrong. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, so we are going to church less, and there's just no denying this. But what is a religion anyways, and, and why do we need it? Well, I think to start with, a religion is or has a controlling story for our lives. It's what we tell ourselves to make sense of the world. And if you think about it, all major religions, not just Christianity, all major world religions have some sort of a story that answers fundamental questions. So, for instance, in Judaism, the uh, story of Israel answers the question about God's love for his people. 
Or think about Islam. The story of the prophet Muhammad answers the question of how God relates to the world through the revelation of the Quran. Or Buddhism. There's the story of Buddha that answers the question about contentment. So again, you can see that different religions have different stories that answer different questions. But it's more than just that. Um, these stories have prescriptive power as well. They not only explain certain parts about life, they also prescribe for us certain ways of living, certain ways of going about our lives, what we should be doing with our time and our energy. So religion has both a set of rules and a set of explanations. But there's more. According to Dave Zoll, religion is something that we lean on. It's what we cling to when things aren't okay and when we have feelings that aren't okay. So for instance, maybe you've felt guilt before. Well, formal religion gives us some sort of absolution, right? Or how about sadness or despair? Those feelings in religion are met with hope, a sense of hope. Or maybe you've felt chaos before, like the world around you is falling apart. Religion gives us purpose. So through religion, we can justify our existence in our lives. Through religion, we can feel like we are enough. And that leads us to these next two words. And I hope your eyes did not just glaze over. <laughs> Righteousness and self-justification. Those are two very churchy words. <laughs> the outside world has no idea, usually, when we say those two words, what we mean by them. But I think Dave Zoll has a good uh, point about what righteousness basically is. It's simply enoughness. To be righteous is to be enough. I think this is a very relatable concept. Am I good enough to marry this person? Am I athletic enough to make this team? Or am I a good enough golfer to join this foursome? Am I smart enough to get into this school? Enoughness is a concept that really dominates all parts of our life. And all of us have this sort of fantasy self in the back of our minds that is enough, that is perfectly enough for the world. And the problem is that we are always falling short of this fantasy self in our minds. I think as sort of a visual example of this, um, these are uh, photo tiles from the social media site Instagram. Instagram is a site where you sh uh, share photos of yourself or other sort of inspirational things. And what I've noticed on Instagram is there's this whole genre of kind of self-love, self-help kind of tiles that people post to really make themselves feel better. So, you know, you're a 10, happiness looks good on you, don't be so hard on yourself, shut up, I think you are gorgeous. These are all ways, I think, we are trying to prove to the world that we are enough. But like I said, we're always somehow missing the mart. And this is where self-justification comes in. So if we're always missing the mark, we have to somehow edit our personalities to impress others and to impress ourselves. We have to somehow change the outside part of ourselves to make us feel like we're enough. And so where is self-justification at work in your life? Well, the best clue to this is where in your life are you the most tired? Do you exhaust yourself at the office? Do you exhaust yourself trying to produce the perfect life for your kids? Do you exhaust yourself trying to make friends or trying to keep friends? Whatever it is that is making you the most tired right now is probably a good clue to your own version of replacement religion. So religion might be in decline and we have that graph to prove it, but Alas, if our current cultural climate tells us anything, is that the needs addressed by religion for hope, purpose, connection, justification, enoughness, they haven't diminished as churches have become tap rooms and theaters. The psychic energy involved hasn't evaporated. It can't. It has to go somewhere. We may have ditched church, culturally speaking, but somehow we can't escape church. <laughs> we still have that need to feel like we're enough, to feel that connection or purpose or hope or justification. Those are all still very much real needs. And the world has for us different replacement religions that come in and they, they fill those needs. And guess what? 
Pharisees aren't just a phenomenon of Christianity. <laughs> Every single one of these replacement religions has its own judges, people who have sort of the in and the out kind of standard judgments, you know. So you may think of religion as something you do on a Sunday, but religion, as this series will explore, is something that has come to dominate all areas of our life. David Zoll calls this seculosity. Traditional religion focuses on the vertical, on our relationship to God and our own inner being, how that inner being can be improved. Seculosity is a sort of horizontal religion, where it's not about being enough in front of God, it's about being enough for those around us. And to do that, we don't fix our insides, we fix our outsides. We try to impress other people with what we do with our outward personalities. So the goal in this series is to open our eyes to see what areas of our life that this seculosity is at work, what areas of our life we're trying to be enough in. Because it's only when we do this that we can see the beauty of the gospel. Because the gospel tells us that we are enough, that God loves us for who we are right now, and that we can take rest in that message of acceptance. The gospel tells us that God doesn't actually care that much about religion or religious people. What God cares about are people who love him because they know how much he loves them. So that's where our series will take us. And we've got a whole list of topics. Uh, David Zoll covers more in his book. So again, if you're interested in this series, I definitely recommend the whole book. Um, But we begin this week with busyness and work. Uh, Next week, we will be exploring politics, which I think will be very timely. Um, And then we will be going through kind of sports and fandom, uh, romance, food, and then parenting. So I think a good list of topics about our many different replacement religions. But what is a good example of this horizontal religion at work? Well, I think maybe the most obvious place for all of us to turn to is busyness and our working lives. So here are more questions for you to consider. Uh, If you flip over your page, there's another blank spot. Do you feel like your life has gotten busier or less busy in the last five years? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Can you imagine a life lived without a score sheet? Does that prospect make you feel excited, nervous? How do you feel when people ask you what you do for a living? Is it easy to answer that question, or do you avoid it? So again, I'll give you a few uh, minutes to, to ponder this. So just a show of hands, whose life has gotten more busy over the last five years? <laughs> I know mine has. <laughs> um, I wonder if this meme has ever described you. <laughs> it says, me trying to excel in my career, maintain a social life, drink enough, water, exercise, text everyone back, stay sane, survive, and be happy. And it's got a picture of Corella DeVille from 101 Dalmatians trying to chase that band full of puppies. <laughs> and I think sometimes busyness makes us feel this way, kind of that chaotic and that wits in and just trying to strain forwards like poor Corella DeVille here. <laughs> um, ask a person a decade ago how they were feeling, just a random person on a random day, and they would probably tell you, oh, I'm feeling well or, or fine, maybe. I've noticed, though, that within the last few years, if you ask a person, just a random person on a random day, how they're feeling, they'll probably tell you, busy. Or, in the case of this pandemic season, (laughs) just hanging on, right? We've all grown more busy in our personal and professional lives. But the dirty little secret is that we might actually prefer this. 
Why has busyness come to define our lives so much? When we feel busy, we often fa- feel valuable. We feel desired. We feel justified. We feel important to have a full schedule, right? And it's when people need us, it makes us somehow feel like we are enough. Keeping up with this busyness, though, is a religion in and of itself. It's like we're always trying to feed some sort of a hungry beast, <laughs> a beast that demands more and more of our time. Why do we go to that coworker's party on a Saturday that we, we don't even like that much, but we go to it anyways. We put it in our little schedule book. Or why do we go in on a Saturday to do something that could really wait on Monday in the office? Well, I think it's because we're trying to constantly feed the beast of busyness And by bringing him the sacrifice of our time, we figure that by doing so, we may turn out to be just enough. Staying busy often makes us feel lovable. I should have, I meant to mention this earlier, but um, I'm counting myself in the midst of of all of this. I'm not trying to preach down to anyone. This is my own replacement religion too. So I'm as much as uh, anyone else. I, I feel these things all the time. That's a funny little cartoon. Um, I think the need to stay busy is most true in our working lives. (laughs) The cartoon reads, I'm not a workaholic, I just work to relax. (laughs) Workaholism is a real problem, especially in the United States. The U.S. leads the developed world in the most untaken vacation days each year. And U.S. workers claim to clock in 1,788 hours each year which is 120 more than people in the UK, 300 more than French workers, and 400 more than German workers, which is astonishing considering the robustness of uh, Germany's economy. We as Americans simply love to work. As an example of workaholism, meet Erin Callan. Erin was nicknamed the most powerful woman on Wall Street. She was the CFO of Lehman Brothers right before the 2007 crash. Here is what she says about workaholism. She says, I didn't start out with the goal of devoting all of myself to my job. It crept in over time. Each year that went by, slight modifications became the new normal. First, I spent a half hour on Sunday organizing my email to-do list and calendar to make Monday morning easier. Then I was working a few hours on Sunday, then all day. My boundaries slipped away until work was all that was left. Work can gradually become who we are. The two can become synonymous really quickly. What we do for work gives us, gives us worth and identity, and that, that's a good thing. But it's a bad thing when it becomes the sole source of our worth and our identity. And why is it that we love to work so much? Well, I think one of the reasons is because work is quantifiable. We can count the number of hours we spend in the office. We can count the results from that work in the office. We can count the cash that we bring home. And it's tempting to attach a number to ourselves. And with that number, we might feel more able, more worthy, more enough. Measuring yourself based on productivity is a very tempting thing to do. At some point, though, this gives up. We may spend more and more time at the office working or, or uh, not, not uh, spending enough time at home, but at some point we figure out what Michael Scott from the office figures out in this scene. So some of Michael Scott's employees have been playing a, bad, a really bad prank on him. And so in this scene, he's decided to consult his old boss, Ed Truck, on what to do as a boss. Ed, hi, thanks for meeting me. (laughs) Must be kind of neat coming back. Yeah, sure. Go upstairs? Uh, Well, honestly, Ed, I really don't want to be up there right now. So, what's the problem with my kitchen? Oh, no, no, no. You're good. Let's clarify. You're good. Um, Well, somebody did something in my office. And it was directed at me. Well, what was done? I didn't get a good look at it, but it smells horrible. Yeah, somebody once did that in my office. 
really on figures. So how did you deal with people not liking you? You can't expect to be friends with everybody. You're a kid. No, they'll always think of you as a boss first. Not necessarily. You can love a boss like you do a father. I'm not sure that ever happens. Well, okay. <laughs> Different management styles. Why can't your workers be your workers? Family be your family, your friends be your friends. Last week I would have given a kidney to anyone in this office. I would have reached right into my stomach and pulled it out for them. But now, no. I don't have the relationship. I hope they act so they can hear me say, uh, no, I only give my organs to my real friends. Go get yourself a monkey kidney. <laughs> Go get yourself a monkey kidney. Great line. <laughs> One of the, the running jokes of kind of the office throughout the series is that Michael keeps trying to pretend that the office is his family, that they're all family members and they're friends. And at the end of the show, you kind of see that it's true. But again and again, he discovers that a boss cannot be a father. And co-workers can be friendly with each other. Hopefully they're friendly with each other. But it's, they're still different from family members and real friends you make outside of the workplace. There is a real dividing line between work and home, and it's, it's worth figuring out where that line is. But of course, once you are addicted to something, it's, it's very hard to just quit. This is particularly hard with workaholism. Our successful friend Aaron Callan did not end up learning how to work less. She had to fail to get there. Here is what she writes. Inevitably, when I left my job, it devastated me. I couldn't just move on. I did not know how to value who I was versus what I did. What I did was who I was. Without the financial crisis, I may never have been strong enough to step away. Perhaps I needed what felt at the time like some of the worst experiences in my life to come to a place where I could be grateful for the life I had. No matter how successful you've been in your career, I have bet you felt at least at some point some sense of failure. And as Christians, we might learn how to pay a special attention to those moments of failure. Because it's in failure that God speaks to us. And the words of Robert Capon, that's a name worth looking up, Robert Capon. If the world could have lived its way to salvation, it would have long ago. The fact is that it can only die its way there. It can only lose its way there. We escape to the office, we fill up our calendars, we put more and more in because we assume that by doing this, we will be enough. It will be enough to be saved. But what the gospel reveals to us is that the exact opposite is true. Our accomplishments don't count for anything in front of God. Only our failures count for everything. There is nothing we can do to earn salvation. We can only receive it if we know we failed. That's the irony of the gospel. Oops. And the good news for us is that the way that we assume the world is, that the more hours we put in, the more lovable we become, is actually totally false. Take a listen to what Jesus tells us in one of his parables. It's on your sheet. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. 
And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This parable is scandalous for us in America who pour in over 1,800 hours of work each year. We work more so that we can be more. We expect our labor to be justly rewarded and our wages to match what we put in. These are the rules that we have set for ourselves, and we assume that that's just the way life is. But in God's kingdom, which is the true kingdom, it doesn't matter how many hours you put in. What matters is the generosity of the one who gives us life in the first place. So as you go about your work this week, or you begin to fill up your schedule with other things that make you feel important, remember that God loves you no matter what your output is. If you are going through a rough patch right now at work, or maybe you are, in fact, in between jobs, remember that God is speaking to you right now, and he wants you to find rest and acceptance in him. And if you are at the end of your rope, if you are just worn out, exhausted by all the world has laid on you, remember what our loving Savior says to us again and again and again. Come unto me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So that concludes our first installment in this series. Um, Come back next week for a very timely class on politics led by uh, Mother Nancy. I'm sure that will be an excellent class. Um, Thank you for joining us, either in person or virtually. Um, and God bless you. So, um,